guys ready? Oh yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, this is a smaller crowd than usual, so you're going to have to be really loud and, and, and extra enthusiastic. So first, I have to share what an honor it is to be here among such accomplished students um, and the leaders, uh, you know, amazing leaders of, of, of a tremendous school district. Um, we're here today to, to really celebrate and acknowledge the fact that these individuals have created an app capable of assessing 3D wound uh, proportions that can be there transferred to a 3D printer to manufacture a personalized bioactive glass embedded bandage. So I think that absolutely bears repeating. A 3D wound, wound proportions that can be then transferred to a 3D printer to manufacture a personalized bioactive glass embedded bandage. Now you don't have to remember all of that because our students are definitely going, are going to provide us a step-by-step -step detailed um, you know, introduction of their project. These students have not only persevered through the challenges of this project, but have flourished under the instruction and mentorship of their leaders and teachers, and truly have created something that could potentially save lives. We know in PA nearly 3,000 jobs in the Commonwealth need STEM skills. Over the next decade, more than 70% of jobs will, re will require this knowledge. I'm proud to say that under the leadership of Governor Wolf, Pennsylvania is a national leader in STEM education. By promoting STEM education in classrooms now, our students will be prepared to fill the workforce gap and take on high-tech and in-demand jobs. Since 2015, the Department of Education has advanced the focus of STEM education by launching a statewide cross-sector Pennsylvania STEM coalition in November of 2016, which has now grown to more than 150 members. Establishing standards for computer science education in all Pennsylvania schools. And earlier this month, Governor Tom Wolf also introduced and passed the, in the budget the PA SMART initiative, a first of its kind. It's a $30 million investment to develop and expand computer science and STEM in K-12 education, to prepare and train educators to teach in computer science, STEM, and to offer job training for adults in the computer science industry. The Wolf administration, as well as the Pennsylvania Department of Education, are proud, extremely proud, of the Conrad Weiser High School students who took on this enormous project that, has, that we have the privilege to listen to and hear from them today. So as they explained their project, and I'd also like to um, really acknowledge the fact that a tremendous amount of work went into, to not on today's introduction, but just, the work, just engaging over the course of the year. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Conrad Weiser's Area School District Superintendent, Dr. Grove who has not only been an advocate for his district, but for all school districts across the Commonwealth. Randall. Our small group can give him a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank Secretary Rivera for giving our students the opportunity to be here today and share the work they are doing in the area of STEM. I would also like to congratulate our teachers and students for their pioneering spirit and their forward thinking. In the Connor and Weiser Area School District, we are seeing our STEM programs growing to meet the demands of our students to prepare them for future careers and collegiate opportunities. We are developing a new STEM program at our elementary schools this coming year, led by a new STEM teacher. All students in grades K to four will have several STEM experiences throughout the school year. At our middle school, we are developing many of our science experiences around long range targets and participation in local science fairs and competitions. Students are beginning to self-select an area of interest and explore the world of science through this lens. I hope many of you will stay for our high school, STEMs pre high school STEM teams presentation. What you will see is the pinnacle of STEM education in action. Our Science Research Institute students are developing high-level research in a self-directed atmosphere supported by a group of teachers who have let go of the reins and turned our students loose to dig deeper. Many of our students are working with local, state, national, and even international partners to fund and support their work. 
Many of our student researchers have personal connections to their research topic, which turns their curiosity into passion. This is the ultimate goal in education, to fully engage students in their schooling so they become the drivers, not just the passengers in the learning process. Today you will witness an amazing group of students who have harnessed their individual talents and interests so to collaboratively develop a workable and viable solution to a real world problem. They are currently developing a patent for their intellectual property with the goal of eventually taking their idea to market. It doesn't get more real world than that. The ultimate goal of STEM is to prepare our students to take the next step into college or a career. The work our students are doing today is already elevating them to levels of inquiry, research, and development beyond many colleges and universities. I'd like to thank Governor Wolf for providing the platform for our students to display their talents at the STEM competition and for his leadership in the area of STEM education. Pennsylvania is on the cutting edge for STEM development and our students and teachers are leading the way. And now it's my pleasure to introduce one of the teachers, and I would say kind of the, the impetus behind our, our Science Research Institute, one of the teachers with, that's worked with this group of students, Ms. Adele Shade. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity to highlight our students at Comrade Weiser and our Science Research Institute, which is a part of Comrade Weiser High School. The Science Research Institute that we've developed um, is a model, and this model fosters private, public, uh, corporation, business, industry collaborations, and we also offer authentic scientific experiences for our students. We believe and we know that in this state and in this country, we have students that we don't need to just teach the business and industry and economy of science too. But we have students right now who are brilliant innovators, and if we can give them the opportunities and the resources to go after all of these ideas that they have in their minds, that we have students right now that could impact our economy. We have four students here right now that have an opportunity to impact not only Berks County and not only the state of Pennsylvania, but a global market. These types of experiences are priceless. And I, I take it upon myself as a teacher, and I think it's our, our responsibility to gather this network for them and these resources for them and allow more of our students in the state of Pennsylvania to be able to have this type of authentic experience. I'm really proud of what these four students have, have put together and they're going to explain their, their project um, to you today. We have four students here of a five student team. One student is on vacation in Disney right now. <laughs> and so these four students um, will explain the depth of the project. You should know that when we have business and industry experts who are global come in to talk to these students, they tell me when they leave that these students are like sitting with a group of their engineers. That is, is the level that I think all students in our state can achieve. So I'd like to introduce the student group now and maybe open up to uh, questions um, for them about the project. Uh, so thank you very much. So this is one of the great opportunities to be secretary because um, I said I wanted to introduce the students, so I pulled the rank. <laughs> so we, we have, um, you know, the great opportunity. So first I have to take a moment to say thank you, Randy and Adele, for being here today, but just really, um, you know, highlighting the work of your team and, and being a leader um, around this work for us across the Commonwealth. And, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't say lightly um, across the U.S. So great job and let's give them a big round of applause. Great job. Okay, now I get to introduce the Conrad Weiser High School students who are here today to show us their project. Um, again, a wound measurement app that's capable of recording and documenting patients' wounds. Um, the, Im the image captured on the app is transferred to a 3D printer, 
which can generate a personalized bioactive glass embedded bandage. The project is patent pending as shared and was ranked amongst the finalists in this year's Governor's STEM competition. So the students who are here today to discuss their project are Madison Bright. Madison? Get to say hi. I'll just say hi and we're going to get Rachel Maurer. Hi. Rachel. Abigail Brown. Hi. Yeah. And Jonathan Lamb. And as you heard, unfortunately, team member Evan um, Carneal is not able to join us here today, but it did not tell me that he was in Disney. Um, so, you know, whereas I felt bad for 20 seconds, as I heard that. You know, of course, I also like to take a moment to congratulate Rachel and Madison for graduating from high school and being accepted to college. Rachel is heading to Albright College and will major in biology. And Madison is heading to Thomas Jefferson University and will major in biomedical science. So now it's my privilege to turn this part of the event over to the students to explain their project. And of course, if, the, um, if there's any questions for me or the students, um, I'll make myself available throughout the room as, um, as we enjoy this presentation. So um, we'll let you set up. We'll take our seats and look forward to hearing uh, your amazing project. Thank, Thank you. you. So to give you a little, a little background, about the founders of the Science Research Institute. Um, my name is Adele Shade. I've been teaching 24 years. I uh, love what I do, and I'm constantly going back to school for more education, so I'm still a student as well. I have a master's degree in uh, biology, secondary education, a master's in microbiology from Jefferson, and I'm at the end of my PhD in cell and molecular biology at the Univers University of the Sciences. I was recently appointed to the Department of Pediatric Medicine at the Penn State Medical College. So. Okay. Uh, my name is John Seifert, and uh, I'm entering my 10th year of teaching at Conrad Weiser. Um, the middle name, Adam Searfoss, couldn't be with us today. He's like one of our students. He's actually not on vacation, but he's teaching a course at, um, at Penn State. And I'll kind of introduce ourselves together. Uh, both Adam and I went to Penn State and um, earned degrees in agricultural and extension education. So our background into um, kind of the STEM fields is maybe a little different than, um, than some other teachers. Um, and then Adam has gone on and gotten his Master's of Education from uh, North Carolina State University. And then I uh, recently completed my Master of Science in Chemical and Life Science at the University of Maryland. So we don't like punishment quite as much as Adele. Uh, she's gone for the PhD. We're not quite there yet. Almost finished. <laughs> um, and so we gave you a, a bit of an intro to the vision of the Science Research Institute. And we think it's really important that we provide high-level opportunities for our students, authentic opportunities. Uh, we know we have students that can change the world, and it's our job to get us those to, to get the students those resources, the network that they need, and a lot of what we do uh, is based on the people that we can bring together. So we have partners now, over 60 partners, and they are in higher education, uh, they are in business, industry, and some are local, some are state-driven, uh, we have national, and now we have international business partners as well. And this helps us to build uh, anything the students need for research, for their ideas, to bring those to life. Yeah, so we wanted to show just a, a small collection of the organizations that we've been partnering with. And I love looking at this list. So like Adele mentioned, there's over 60 partners at least that we're able to remember. Um, but if you look at this list, it's maybe not a list that you would um, immediately think of as partnering with STEM um, education. We have uh, right now we're trucking, who, which is one of the largest manufacturers of aluminum trailers in the United States, and I think in North America, um, but passionate about what our students are doing. Uh, and, and some of these corporations or uh, academic institutions or hospitals you would think of, but what we're finding is when, when Adele and I and Adam go and talk to uh, these organizations, they're supportive of, of STEM education, and they think it sounds like a great idea, uh, but when we, when we bring the students and they see this, this uh, STEM education in action, it really comes alive, and they're really, really excited about supporting us. The other 
uh, part of the uh, mission or vision statement that we have at the beginning there is that this is student driven and we're trying to give students authentic experiences. Um, we get a lot of questions about our, our summer program and our, our Science Research Institute, which Adele's gonna talk about a little bit more. And the, the number one thing that this keeps coming back to is students have choice in a lot of different ways. So the first way that they have choice is we're not telling them what they need to learn or what we, even what we think is important for them to learn. Uh, we're really trying to encourage students to think about their passions and come to us with a question, a problem, some kind of issue that is, that's influencing their lives. Um, and then our job is to go back to those, those people that are helping us, all of those collaborators, and see if we can get help for them. The other aspect that students have choice is we love when our students go to, go to science competitions. It's really exciting. They get to share their, their research and share their information. Um, and so we've had a lot of success there. So this picture up here in the upper left-hand corner, this was one of our students that just graduated competing at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair. We've been fortunate to send students there for the last couple of years. Um, down here we have a student, Bryn Worley, who's gonna be a senior with us this year. This is her receiving an award at the National Agri-Science Fair. Um, in Indianapolis, I think last year, maybe two years ago. Uh, so we, we do encourage students to get out and compete and share their research. But some of the other, I, I don't know if I would say more interesting or more exciting ways that they're able to uh, share their information uh, is an example of this uh, picture in the upper right hand corner. This is a student, his name's Cody Dribelbiss. It's just one student and he's not a twin. Um, he's a student that's passionate about science, but also really passionate about film production. And so um, he wasn't really the student to conduct research and take his projects um, you know, and, and present a person, but he's throughout his whole high school career and now going into college, um, and we've actually just hired him for our summer program. He's filming all of our seminars. He's producing um, scientific videos to publicize what we're doing. So a, a really neat example of how um, you know, we, we love research and we love science competitions. Um, but it doesn't always have to be what we think of as that normal kind of formal progression of doing a science fair project. Yeah. And another example we'll show you later in the presentation, these pictures over here. Um, we were recognized two years ago as the only high school in the country to have a fully functioning histology lab where we can take cells and put stains in them and colors and take pictures of them. Well, we had a student partner with a new local brewery, got the yeast from the beer they were making, and that's the artwork in the, in the brewery walls right now, is all of her staining, which is a totally different twist on STEM. And um, we have many other opportunities through the school year for, for our students. Some of the skills we integrate into our courses, we have a summer program, we have year-round mentored research projects, and then competitions if they'd like to, to participate in those. But our summer program, which is happening right now, is a five-week program. Um, we run it for five weeks, but it's very flexible, so students can come and go as their schedule allows. And what we found is when we do that, we have kids in all the time, and they ask us if we can open the lab more than we have it open. So again, they have a lot of choice for when they come, when they work, they seem to appreciate that. We have two grants we were awarded this year for that, one from the Ceramic and Glass Industry Foundation and one from the Berks County Community Foundation, which has allowed us to hire more instructors. You'll see in a moment how our numbers have just grown for this summer program. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go back a little bit and just talk, I, I forgot to mention one more aspect of student-driven um, the student-driven aspect of this. If we would go back maybe four or five, six years ago, um, Adele and Adam and I were three teachers at Conrad Weiser, and I'd like to think that we were all doing really uh, kind of innovative and, and great things with our students, but even we weren't collaborating yet. And it wasn't until a student of ours that's, that's now graduated came and talked to each one of us individually and said, you know, what Ms. Shade is doing is really, like, would really line up well with what you're doing and what Mr. Searfoss is doing. And so uh, I just think it's a great story that we're trying to give more, uh, more options and more control to students in their education. And our students are actually the ones that saw within us that, that we had a pretty um, interesting approach going. We didn't even see it ourselves. So I think that's really cool. Um, 
So our summer program started small. Uh, it actually just started with Adele. And if we go back to year one, Adele was the only instructor and there were 12 students involved. Uh, and they were coming in and out of the high school in the summer. The three of us were all, the one, I think one of the things that really grouped us together is that we were frustrated with um, how quickly the school year goes. I think students would probably disagree with that, but uh, from, the, from the educator standpoint, uh, the school year starts, you're just getting your feet wet, and then all of a sudden it's Thanksgiving break, and then winter break, the semester change, and, and then boom, uh, the year's kind of gone. So the summer program was a way to get students in over the summer um, and just get them thinking, what, what might they be interested so that when the school year starts, um, they can hit the ground running. Um, so Adele got things kicked off, and then in year two, um, Adam and I joined, Mr. Sirfoss, and uh, so there were three instructors and we had 36 students, and we didn't know, uh, we didn't know what we had gotten ourselves into. The project and projects and the ideas uh, were so exciting. Last year, uh, we wanted to kind of keep things, make sure that we had been building it right and doing things well for the students. So we kept the three instructors and it grew just a little bit. And then um, just this year, we opened up the program so that it's now open for students um, grades six through 12. And we actually have a couple college students still coming back to participate in the program. Uh, we have 77 students this summer, um, which is awesome, which is amazing. So many, so many great ideas. And then we, ha we ha had to go out and hire some, some new help. So we've, uh, we've hired some additional instructors. Um, and the whole, as we're, as we're finding, we have lots of gaps in our areas of expertise. So we've hired some middle school teachers to help us. Uh, we've hired a uh, high school math teacher to help us with the statistics in the projects. We've hired um, a language arts English teacher to help us uh, with, the, with the writing component of it. We've uh, brought on our library media specialist who's really opening up our eyes to all of the databases that are available out there. So um, the program is growing in students and then also in advisors, which is really exciting. Um, I just love these graphics, um, a little bit of statistics. I know there are some statistics fans out there. Um, to show you, I know th these numbers might not be showing up very well. This is um, the demographics for this year's summer research program. Uh, for, what is that, 35%? Male. 35% male. Uh, and so the, the orange here is, is female. And we hear a lot about... Yeah. yeah, and so we hear a lot about kind of the, the gender distribution in STEM, but um, we have very strong female representation in, uh, in the STEM programs at Conrad Weiser, which we're really excited about. And then this, I know that again, the numbers are kind of hard to read. Going clockwise around this diagram uh, are participants from sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, and then college. Um, just an interesting look at how we're getting, bringing students into the program, and then obviously students in the high school are getting really excited about this. And a little bit about our, our capabilities. So one of our goals as, as the Science Research Institute, and I'll refer to that as SRI, is to bring high-level equipment to the students as well. This is uh, necessary right now in science. It's really hard to do projects at this level if you don't have the resources you need. And we partner with a lot of these businesses in an industry for these, um, type, this type of equipment. In fact, one of our business partners every year gives a, us a significant amount of money, but there's one stipulation he tells us to this money, and that is he wants us to get something and, and be able to do something that nobody else can do. That, that is the way he thinks. Part of that has really influenced the way we think. Instead of looking average, middle of the road, we're always looking for what's next, what's coming next, and what can we do that nobody else can do yet. And, and these are some of the things we've put together. 3D bioprinting, which is tissue engineering. We're teaching that now down to the sixth grade level. Again, only school in the country to have a histology lab, and we work with our two local hospitals on that. Uh, and we have really high level imaging as well. And then <clears throat> building on, um, so Adele's kind of expertise is with cells and tissues. My expertise lies more on the molecular side. Uh, and so if you think of a, a, a real traditional science fair, imagine one of the most basic science fair projects you could imagine. Let's take two plants and let's add something to one and see how the growth um, is affected. What we're asking and encouraging students to do now is ask deeper. Why is, okay, why is this one plant growing more or less? 
Um, and now with our equipment, we're able to determine uh, with some of these things over here, what proteins are being more expressed in one, in, in one plant versus the other. And then on the other side, genetic, are, are there differences between those two plants that could be you know, also uh, coming into play there? So a lot of equipment that we're really excited about and we know that our students are getting access to pieces of equipment that I learned maybe in, in graduate school uh, and in undergraduate if I was lucky. And then the third piece that we'll add, and this is um, Adam's area of expertise, Mr. Sirfoss, who's not here with us. Um, we're both trained uh, in agricultural education. So we're both FFA advisors. And I think sometimes people will come into Conrad Weiser and see the ag program and the other pieces um, with, with SRI uh, and are a little bit surprised by that. But um, FFA and agricultural education are, are vocational in nature, and so they, they were always born out of this idea that it's best to learn by doing things with our hands. And uh, I'm really looking forward uh, you know, in the future to see how Ag Ed is gonna be able to tie in with STEM, because our, you know, there's no better way to learn than by going out into the greenhouse or going out into the barn and then implementing some of these science practices that we've been doing um, elsewhere. Yeah. Another thing that's been driving our equipment is my experience in Philadelphia working in the research labs there. We get high school interns in all the time from the high schools in Philadelphia. They have a 10 minute train ride. They can be at a high level research institution that has all the equipment they could dream of using. And our location being in, in Rabazonia, somewhat rural, we don't have access to those kinds of things. So when, we, when I was looking at this disparity, the only option was to bring it to Conrad Weiser. And, and that's where our business partners come in. A couple examples of projects that were going on this past year. You may think, okay, here, here's a great team. These are your top four superstars in the school, but what about everybody else? Well, we had 130 independent projects going on this year, and we have eight students with patent and intellectual property opportunities. So it's, it's not just this group. We have a student who wanted to start out by printing a meniscus for a knee, bioprinting, and his project totally took a turn uh, because of the silk he was using, and he started feeding silkworms different combinations in the food, and now he has an industry um, expert looking at his project as a new and incoming silkworm feed. Um, and he sees this as one thing that could help America compete with China and India um, in the silk industry. We have um, another student who again was bioprinting and has physicians interested in her new look at the connection between an ACL and bone for ACL replacements. We have a 10th grade student who's working with the leader in cardiac uh, pediatrics at Penn State Hershey, they are looking at cardiomyopathies in students. These are the student athletes you hear about that go out to the field one day and just drop over. And they're creating uh, screenings for these students. There was one in York last year. We're looking to spread that through Pennsylvania this year to be able to identify these students before that fatal event happens. So we're working with Penn State Hershey on this, and she's also working with the University of Tennessee. We now have 10,000 student athletes she's evaluating to see if we can find the best way to screen them ahead of time. Push this through Pennsylvania and then through the rest of the country. Uh, we had a, some projects this year, again, go to Intel. This is the largest competition in the world for science fair projects. 81 countries, 1,800 of the top students, and our school had three uh, participants there this year. Two, two of them are here right now. And they'll tell obviously the details about their project, but the other project that went has now been picked up by the University of Sciences in Philadelphia, and it is a protein from wasp venom that can target breast cancer cells and not healthy cells to kill them. This you'll hear a lot about in a moment, but we have our governor STEM team here today. Um, we also took students to the Pennsylvania Junior Academy of Science, uh, which was held at the contest at Penn State. Um, 
So these were our 10 participants, all female. Everyone there placed either first or second in their category. And we wanted to um, highlight um, this young woman, Gabby Torsha, who was one of five students in Pennsylvania to win the Pennsylvania Science Talent Award. Um, and you know, we don't want to, we want to let these guys talk about their projects, so we can't talk about them all. Uh, a couple on the agricultural side, we had two students win uh, grand champion at the Pennsylvania FFA Agri-Science Fair, which is held at the Farm Show Complex. Uh, and their, their, con their title of the project was Drosophila Neuron Viability in Bioactive Glass. So again, you're hearing a lot about bioactive glass today. Uh, and not just from a human medical standpoint, also in the, uh, from an animal and agricultural standpoint. Uh, and then this year, uh, it was an exciting year at the National FFA Agri-Science Fair in Indianapolis. Um, some really interesting projects. These two uh, young ladies over here, Jillian Rathman and Sarah Kern, used DNA barcoding to detect uh, impurities in herbal teas. Uh, and they found some interesting stuff in, their, uh, in the herbal teas that they tested using molecular techniques. They placed third in their category in the food systems um, division at that contest. And then uh, Joe Grissoy, I think I showed a picture of him earlier, used uh, saliva to detect gluten sensitivities in both humans and dogs. So it's difficult to detect uh, celiac disease, uh, but he was wondering if he could use saliva as a way to do that and found a lot of success and has some interest as well. And then uh, Adele mentioned this past school year, we mentored 130 other projects. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big undertaking, and we wish we could, we could talk about all of them. There, there's so many more really interesting ones, but this is just a, you know, a small collection of those. Right. Um, we had some, one student, really interesting project, and he takes his, the days that he has off from school, and he travels to different veterans' hospitals um, to evaluate the Gulf War veterans that had a sarin gas antidote and are now showing signs of MS. And he wants to figure out why, because his father has friends that were, that were in that war. Um, so projects all over the spectrum. So thank you um, for your attention. And, for, and we'll open for any questions for the Science Research Institute. And then we'd like the students to present their project. So are there any questions about SRI? at this point. Okay. So we'll have the students start their presentation now. Thank you. Hi, we're the scientists from Conrad Weiser's STEM team. Uh, we started our project at the Science Research Institute. I'm John Lamb, grade 11 computer scientist and app designer. I'm Abigail Brown, grade 12, and I'm the biologist and mathematical designer. I am Madison Bright. I will be attending Jefferson University in this fall, and I was the microbiologist and material scientist. Hi, I'm Rachel Maurer. I will be attending Albright College in the fall, and I was the biomedical material scientist. Again, Evan is not here today, um, but he was the mathematical 3D and software designer. Our project is develop an app that could take a picture of a wound and display the proportions such as length, width, and possible explorations of depth, and send it to a 3D printer as G-code to be able to print a bioactive personalized bandage for the wound. All images without citations or original works of the authors or freely distributed clip art. So this would be the general overview of the project altogether. The app would send the G-code of the measurements over to a 3D printer to be able to print the bandage. So Evan and I worked together on printing the 3D um, bandage. And that's the 3D printer that we have been working with. Um, And the bandage that would be printed would be printed into different layers. Each layer was made of chemically composed of different types of bioactive glasses. And Maddie and I worked on that chem chemical composition together. Additionally, we also wanted to make sure that this bandage was personalized for patient care to ensure that their wound was properly treated. The app would also be able to send the wounds, like proportions and such, to insurance companies to allow better communication between the two. So we know that two in every 100 wounds reported in the United States annually result in infection. And this is due to the lack of proper antimicrobial agents currently being used in hospitals in bandages, as well as exposure to non-sterile environments, 
in hospitals and at home. Additionally, there have been um, inaccurate measuring techniques currently being used. So there have been advancements in 3D printing that we are using for our research to create this bandage. So um, specific to Pennsylvania, this project and research that we've been doing could greatly um, bring economic boost in the market production and product production of our materials, as well as it could decrease the reliance on antibiotic and antifungal medications that are given to patients for infection. As well as, wound care would be totally personalized. It would be different from every single person, and each wound would be treated properly. So we've started a relationship with two national companies that specialize in wound care, but can't tell the names. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we've also started a relationship with Ted Day, who is the CEO of Mosai Corporation. He provides us with the necessary resources and mentorship for our project. We've based our marketing plan off of DSM, and they're located in Pennsylvania. We've also uh, have a relationship with Monoprice Incorporated. They provide us with a 3D printer. So I want you to think of a bandage today. When you think of that, you might think of a band-aid or a gauze pad, but what you might not know is for the past 100 years, we've been using the same material. We've been using wool, lint, and gauze. So why is the rest of the world advancing and we're not with wound care? That was really the start of our project. We wanted to be the advancement, the new thing for wound care. Um, so those three, there's three key points that we have to focus on when we're thinking about advancing wound care. And those key points are convenient for the patient, it's an easy cost, and allows rapid healing. The only way that we can hit those three points is if we have a warm, moist, oxygen-enriched, and sterile environment. I developed the app using Apple software Xcode. It runs off the language Swift, and it's uses the, it uses the Apple's recently developed AR kit it allows to, for a print, like, where you tap on the app and it puts a point, and then you tap on another area. It'll measure the length between the points you had. And I programmed the user interface to be as user-friendly as possible. So kind of going off of what John did in the app, I did the mathematical background of everything for him to be able to get those specific length measurements. I did this by creating my own algorithm based on a graph that is on an XY plane so coordinates could be found. And um, that is the algorithm. Um, it is based on basic algorith algorithms that I've learned in my common math class of slope, y-intercepts, x-intercepts, all the things that I've learned I've put into use into this project. This is a more detailed graph of where the variables in the algorithm come from. So each variable is very specific. And the end goal is to focus on a focus point of the wound intending to be the deepest point. So therefore, the depth of the wound could be determined. and the length and the width can be determined for the proportions. However, when I tested my algorithm specifically in John's app, it didn't produce the results that I had really were hoping for, but it did um, produce a conversion factor that I think I will be able to use um, in possibly my own algorithm or another one that um, is determined by the percent error range that I have found. To identify the different layers of the bandage, we use different color-coded filaments to show the bioglass, bioactive glass composition of the bandage. Abby's uh, for algorithm allowed us to get the precise measurements for the bandage, and the app also changed the measurements to G-code for the bandage to be able to print it. So you're probably all wondering what bioactive glass is. Um, this is the main product that is in our bandage, and it is a product that is composed of high purity chemicals found naturally in your body, and it has three main capabilities. First, it is designed specifically for wound care, so it regenerates cells in areas where there is damaged tissue. Second, it is extremely absorbent, so it can absorb large amounts of body fluid. And third, it is extremely sterile, so it prevents many different types of infection. 
As well, it is biodegradable in the body. And over our research, we've tested numerous formulas of the bioactive glass, including phosphate-based, silica-based, and borate-based. Um, in my specific research, I focused on borate-based. So we know that bioactive glass is, can be used as an antibacterial and is an antimicrobial uh, mi properties, but there is a lack of literature pertaining to the use of bioactive glass as an antifungal. So I focused on a fungus called Candida albicans, which is responsible for a 50% mortality rate. And this is because it has become more and more drug resistant, as well as adhering to medical equipment and surgical implants used in hospitals and at home. And so um, here's a graph of some of my uh, research. And so um, the first bar shows the control group, which contained no bioactive glass and just fungus. As, as you can see, there was uh, much more growth of the Candida albicans. And then these three bars show um, when there was an intervention of the uh, bioactive glass, and there were different formulas I tested, and it shows that they were much, much more efficient in killing the uh, fungus compared to when there was nothing added. As well, I ran spectrophotometer testing, which um, I used different formulas of the borate-based bioactive glass, and this test showed that 1550 and 1624 were the most um, efficient types of bioactive glass in killing the Candida albicans. And I also ran um, live cell imaging of uh, plates that contained the Candida albicans, Dicty cells, and borate-based bioactive glass. So I wanted to see how well the bioactive glass would work at different amounts. And through my imaging, it showed that 0 0.004 grams was the most effective in killing the Candida albicans and proliferating Dicty cells. So you're probably wondering how we made the bandage. Um, we actually have a prototype with us. <laughs> um, so as you can see, there's multiple different layers on this prototype. I know it might be a little hard to see. Um, but each layer actually represents a different type of the healing process that our body goes through when we have a wound. So we know that um, our first layer is going to be the up here, and it's going to be the deepest one into the wound. So the reason why we're changing wound care, it's not just because it's not advancing, it's also because we're getting infections, we're getting all these other things that we don't want in our wounds. So when we use bioactive glass, and with our bandage, it will actually be able to sit right inside the wound. So the top layer would actually be sitting on the skin. The reason why we can do that is because bioactive glass is sterile. Now, what we're using, we're using right, right now in our, um, our own bandage wound healing stuff, we are using bacitracin, um, other things that are very topical, meaning that are not getting deep into the wound, cleaning it out. Because bioactives is sterile, sterile, we can get that right into the wound and get everything out. Um, and then it, because we can do that, we can layer it so that it looks like the healing process. Each layer is composed of different types of bioactive glass that help with the healing process itself. Again, I can't go through what specifically is in it because of our technical agreement. Um, but it does go really well with the healing process. Another uh, layer of the bandage is the adhesive, which is, I'm really proud of myself, I made it, <laughs> um, which took forever. But um, it's made of all natural ingredients. Again, can't go into that. Um, but I will tell you that it encourages all natural healing and it has this organic appeal to the public, um, which is really good, especially if you're putting it into your body. So um, as John said previously, our marketing idea is based on DSM Biomedical. Their concept is um, we'll give you some of the equipment, but you're going to have to pay for like the software, the materials to make it. So what we w we're planning on doing one day, hopefully, is um, we'll give you our 3D printer that we intend to make specific for this bandage. And then um, you're going to have to buy the software that he's made. You're going to have to buy the adhesive. You're going to have to produce that bandage yourself. So each bandage is personal for each patient. So with that being said, these bandages could really help all ages, from newborns to elderly with all wound types, as well as um, 
we hope that it could reach developing nations who need that extra support in their infection treatment, their wound care. As well as this product we see in hospitals, ambulances, like where the um, ambulance comes, picks you up, you have a wound, they take a picture of it, those pictures are gonna be sent to the hospital. The hospital produces that bandage while you're on your way to the hospital, so when you get there, you have a bandage personalized for your wound. As well as our improvement for this research is um, previously um, that we said each um, layer of the bandage is a different color filament. We want those filaments to be embedded with the bioactive glass to ensure that our uh, bandage is effective in patient healing, as well as the biodegradable filament. So in conclusion, what we've learned, um, if you haven't noticed when we were talking about what we do in this group, we all have different expertise. And I think that's really important. And we learned some really cool things through that. Um, when John talks about what he's doing with his G-code, I have no idea. Um, but when I'm talking about how to make the filament, he has no idea. But when we come together and all of us come together, we can make something really great. We've also seen this business side of science. And it's really interesting because kids our age don't get to see that. Maybe if they're lucky and they have research like us that we can get patented. Um, but when we take our research, our science that we're doing, and we combine it with the business that we're learning, we learn that we can have improved patient care, we can have American manufacturing, and we can also have job development, not only in our little county, but also in Pennsylvania and the world. Thank you for listening to our presentation. If you have any questions, we would love to answer them. So I was asked just to do a little bit of an overview about where we are and where we see this going. And in, 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 I've talked to the students a number of times, and they're kind of growing in it. So they don't kind of see, so I think, sometimes how amazing what they're doing is, because they're doing it. Um, so right now, as we look at SRI, it's a different way to engage students in the learning process. All right. And it builds, you heard them talk about their skills. They're getting those skills from their, their coursework. It builds on their foundation of literacy, numeracy, science, and all the other skills that, that they're garnering along the way. And then the teachers with the SRI, they've amassed a lot of specialized equipment. Without that equipment, they would not have the opportunity to take some of their ideas to the next level. So it's, it's a combination of all of those things, different way of thinking. Um, that STEM, that, that STEM piece, but also building on the things they've already learned, and then have an opportunity with some high-level equipment. You talk, we talked a little bit about the partners, and you can see all those local partners are coming together. That's another piece that we often don't include in our regular public ed school districts. We say we partner. Well, we have some fundraisers that they come out and then maybe they, they give us you know, some dollars to buy some things. But this is true partnership in their realm, in the realm of these partners. And they're starting to see the value of what our students can do in high school. And they're stepping up to support it. Not just with dollars, but many times with equipment, uh, with some of the consumables, some of the ideas, and the expertise. So what we would like to do, what we see this as going out and attracting students from other schools. I don't know if they talk about that, but in our SRI program this summer, we have four students from other school districts. Uh, there was a grant uh, that they got, and so a couple of other kids are coming over from other school districts. We also have a young lady from a neighboring school district who expressed an interest in our biomedical program. Uh, her mother works for us. And I kind of worked a deal with their superintendent, and their board approved her to come to Connor and Weiser the coming school year. They are going to pay the tuition, and she's coming to Connor and Weiser because that's what's best for her. Uh, unfortunately, 
Um, I know of some other students, and I've been in contact with some other superintendents, where they're not really, they're not ready to do that. So we see something that's valuable, not just for our students, but we could scale this out and ask other students to come and join us. Um, but we need a, a mechanism to do that. So next steps. We want to help develop a way to allow students from other schools to participate, not just in the summer program, but also during the school year. Um, as the program grows, we're going to have to add to our facility. So we're looking for some state and local partners to not only help invest in the program, but also expand the program uh, beyond our walls to help uh, make some space for kids in other uh, from, from Berks County to come and join us. And we really see that this model, the, the SRI model, and what our teachers and students are doing, this can be replicated in other places. I don't think this can be done in every single high school. Uh, the, the level of expertise, the kind of equipment that we have, that's going to be very specialized. But this could be something that could happen regionally, that other kids from other schools could come to a central place. Similar to what we do with our career and technology centers. Uh, we could have opportunities where kids can come and join in our program from other schools. I want to talk a little bit about impact. And if, if, if we come to PDE or we come to the Capitol, we don't talk about Keystones. We're talking about high school kids. We, we're kind of doing it in disservice. The last two years, and I was able to run this data uh, just about a week ago, we've had um, between, uh, you know, you saw 30 some or, or 78 kids involved in the SRI. If I took all of the students from the SRI program to date, it's about 175 kids. Any student in SRI who's already taken a Keystone, these are their results. This is how many kids are scoring at advanced and proficient. So in 2017, Algebra 1, Lit, and Bio, and then 2008. So the kids that are a part of this group are, are, are doing very well uh, on the Keystones. I will tell you this, as you look at that population, it's not just all our top dogs. It's not. Um, the, some of them are, but we have kids coming from just about every strata of our student population, and these kids are doing very well. So what I want to do is give you an opportunity to ask questions of our students. Uh, I have an, my administrative team is here, our teachers are here, so I'm going to open up to questions about their research and also about the future of where we see this going. Amen. Good, good seeing you, Randy. So, first of all, fantastic presentation. I'm Matt Stem. I'm the Deputy Secretary for all of our K-12 schools. So this is incredibly uh, uh, exciting to, to watch and see how this is playing out. So I have a process question for the four of you. Um, we talked about the specialization that each one of you brings to the work. Uh, and then, of course, there's a fifth member of the team that wasn't here. Um, so how do you manage a project? How do you collaborate so that, um, number one, you probably aren't together all day long every day the way maybe some research scientific teams are. So how do you stay connected and how do you keep from crossing into each other's lanes? Uh, like, who, you know, who, how do you, who's the arbiter of who gets to make some of those final decisions to keep the project moving mm -hmm. forward? So two-part question. Well, I would say that we as a team at the beginning we had no idea about any of our abilities individually, but when we like came together, we like realized that like, yeah, Rachel is really good in like producing the chemical compositions and everything, and John, that is definitely not what he does. So <laughs> there's, there's some separation between the two, but like John would be interested in Rachel's research because it's like one project and we all work together in it, that there's no like boundaries. We, we work as friends, we, it's just, it's, I would say it's more like a friend research group and we're just like doing something that we all love. And like it incorporates all of our aspects that we're interested in. So I would say there's no boundaries for what limits we have. Yeah, picking back off of what Abby said, I think like, John would have, for some reason, and I'm not saying he couldn't, but for some reason he's like, let's try this chemical composition. I'd be like, let's go for it. Like, I don't, there's definitely no boundaries at all. I mean, even though he might be more G-code or his crazy coding skills, you know, I think that we all just want to succeed together. We don't want to, you know, have more of a specific part, but rather just be one group, one together. Um, and like, I think the second part of the question about who really dictates, I think we kind of just, I mean, we're still high school students. Well, 
we were um but yes uh but um we kind of went to other like teachers so our group like they said we kind of go out and they let us off the reins and we go do our thing but in the end we always go back to somebody who might know more about it so we've actually been in contact with people who have coded apps before and asked questions and that kind of determined what our final say was thank you any other questions so i'm interested in terms of uh, the practical application of, of um uh, of your project. Have any of you used the bandage to, to heal one of your wounds? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't actually made it yet. We have a prototype, but it's plastic. Um, but we have hopefully like, one day we can. We have like all the components. Yeah. We just, we're like in the process of like eventually putting it all together because yeah. we're missing a little bit yet still, but yeah, it's like, almost there. Yeah, Miss Chi, go ahead. One piece of their project, the fibrous bioactive, borate based bioactive glass, was just FDA approved in September. So it's extremely novel. Clinical studies for that piece just went through. Before you could put it on a person, you have to have an approved, IRB approved clinical study. Um, so they, they worked on the cellular side, and that is a next step. No problem. And I just wanted to mention, um, if any of you are really confused about what bioactive glass actually looks like, this is, we have some examples up here. It's um, melted down at extremely high temperatures. So um, like this one is blue because it has zinc and silver in it. Um, this one's white because it does not. But um, you can feel it if you're interested. Um, it feels like cotton candy a little bit. So. So if there's no other questions, I'm going to turn the question back to the department and ask you folks, um, is, is this part of the direction that we want to, we want to head in Pennsylvania? If, if, this, if we're talking about STEM education and getting kids to this level by, by the time they get into high school, is this the kind of thing um, that you folks would be behind in scaling this out to attract other kids? So, so the, the two-part question. The first part of your question is, is absolutely, is we're looking at um, the alignment of our vision for STEM, STEM education, and, and you know, preparing students, um, you know, to lead in industry, and, and you know, of course, to um, earn and land livable wage and beyond in employment. So, so that part, absolutely. Um, the second part of the job around the scale, you know, the second part of the question around the scalability, um, you know, of course, that's, that's, that's always the nuanced, you know, answer. So, so the question would be high, you know, good, high-quality programs? Yes. Um, you know, how that fits, I mean, you know, we can't discount the fact that um, you have a really committed, um, you know, team that, that, you know, is working year-round to, you know, to develop a, a program like that. So as we look at opportunities to partner with other school districts, um, do they have the same level of expertise and, and commitment to make it work? Um, secondly, you know, the, the um, diversity of your, of your industry partners. Um, you know, are there others that would be willing to, to become partners? So I think, um, A, definitely. B, it's looking at all the conditions and seeing how, you know, how it fits for sustainability um, and continuous, um, uh, you know, continuous investment. So mm -hmm. yeah. And I think as, as I've listened to, to and watched some of the, the press coming out from the department, also from Governor Wolf, it's that public-private partnership that I think is going to continue to drive everything in Pennsylvania, not just education, but business, bring that all together. And I think what our students and what our teachers have demonstrated is not, it may be novel now, but I think it really is the future of where we want to go um, with, with our education that that partnership, you talk about these, these students being college and career ready, they're ready to talk to the colleges about the kinds of things they're doing. They're already talking to industry, um, and I think they're, they have a really great model and something that we can push forward. Any other questions for myself or for our students? 
Well, I want to again just thank you so much for having us here. It's it's been a real treat. Uh, like I said, this is this is one team of kids. They did fantastic things, but we have a lot of other kids uh, behind them, uh, kind of on their coattails, uh, doing the next phase of projects. And also, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to thank our teachers as well. So thank you so much. Oh, Maddie has something to say. Okay. Um, it up here, I'm sure you see all these posters. Um, it just is kind of broken down into each individual project. So if you want to look at these and ask us like individual questions, go for it. <laughs> yeah. all, right. all right, thank you.